Would you believe it if I told you that getting this one thing wrong will completely destroy your AR-15, in addition to making you look kind of stupid like this guy? Now, if you want on this 44 Magnum, you can shoot it single action. In fact, most people consider this to be the most important decision you'll have to make when choosing an AR-15 or choosing an AR-15 to build. But what is this one thing? Is it the trigger? Nope. How about the receiver set? Does it matter if you get forged or CNC or get something that looks Gucci? Not so much. How about the handguard? They are important, but it's not it. How about the bolt carrier group? The bolt carrier group is a very, very important part of the gun, but it's not what we're talking about today. The bolt carrier group is very important for other reasons, which I've already made a video on. I will link it in the description so you can watch it after today's video. But I will say what we're talking about in today's video and the bolt carrier group are the two most important things that you need to consider when you're buying or building an AR-15 or it will be completely destroyed. So what is this one thing? It's the barrel. Now, I understand barrels sound boring. And in fact, when you look at them, they're, they're pretty basic and they're pretty boring to think about and look at. Choosing the wrong barrel on your AR-15 can really screw up your gun in a few different ways. Number one, it can make your gun incredibly inaccurate. Number two, it could wear out really fast. Number three, Choosing the wrong barrel will actually make your gun way too heavy or way too light, depending on what you're using it for. Number three, it could actually blow up. Yeah, that's happened. Number five, you could waste a lot of money if you choose the wrong one. Now this topic of choosing the best AR-15 barrel really shouldn't be as difficult as it is. However, it is for a couple of different reasons. Number one, we have a lot of brands that have made big waves in the gun community. They are very reputable brands. Maybe they got a military contract. And so when they get a military contract, it almost adds like validation to their claims and they make claims about certain things. And then people bandwagon on that and create internet gun myths. A lot of those things that they claim could be very true and some of them just are snake oil features. And so today we're gonna to explore the mythical world of AR-15 barrels so you can make a more well-educated decision when you're choosing your rifle or your barrel when you're gonna build one. In fact, when I was doing the research for today's video, I learned quite a bit of knowledge that I didn't know before. And I've been into AR-15s for seven-ish years and I still am always learning something new every single day. And I say that to make this point. Number one, I am not an expert at anything. I'll never claim to be an expert. I'm always a student and I'm always learning something new. I'm the only one running this channel. I make mistakes all the time and sometimes I don't catch those mistakes during the editing process. So if you catch any mistakes, feel free to correct me down in the comments. Also, if you have any additional knowledge that I don't cover in today's video, feel free to share that down in the comments as well. And a lot of the topics that we're gonna cover about AR-15 barrels today are gonna be controversial. There are gonna be people that argue both sides of the coin when it comes to certain things. And both sides always make valid points usually. I mean, there'll be people arguing about twist rates. There'll be people arguing about metallurgy of the barrel. There's all kinds of things. In addition to a lot of these features that are gonna be debated upon, there's always exceptions to every rule. So for example, some people might say, don't buy this type of barrel because you can't be accurate with it. I guarantee you there is a barrel out there that's an exception to the rules. So instead of discussing the exceptions today, we'll get into that in future videos. My goal in today's video is to help you guys and myself really understand what the trade-offs are with various features of a barrel. And the goal of today's video is not to sell you on a particular brand or anything like that. I will have a list with links and promo codes for my favorite barrels for different purposes at different price points. If you follow the first link in the description or the link that's pinned in the comments, that'll take you over to that list. However, my goal is to create a video that you can refer to whenever you're choosing an AR-15 for various purposes. And these are just gonna be general guidelines. The way I come to understand AR-15 barrels is there's three main things to understand. Number one, the purpose of your rifle or pistol or short barrel rifle determines what you're gonna buy. Not brand, not brand loyalty, not internet gun myths. Number two, you can't have it all. There's always gonna be trade-offs. Typically, you can't have a gun that you can go out and shoot full auto, get the barrel hot, and then sit down on a gun rest and shoot sub MOA groups. That typically doesn't happen. Now, there might be exceptions to that, which we'll cover in future videos, but as a general rule, not gonna happen. Number three, buy nice or buy twice. Also known as buy once, cry once. Now that does not mean to buy the most expensive barrel on the market. We'll cover more on that in a little while. So I always start with the purpose 
of what the gun is intended for. And I classify the purpose of the gun in about three different categories that are very broad. And each of these categories has subcategories. Um, we're not gonna go through all the subcategories, we're just gonna stick to the three main. Number one, general purpose rifle. This is gonna be a gun like your typical 16 inch AR-15s that are pretty basic. They're gonna run pretty reliably. They're gonna shoot bullets relatively accurate. And they do a lot of things well, but they don't excel at one thing a lot. Like a gun that excels at sub MOA accuracy typically isn't gonna be the most reliable gun to go to war with. That's just part of the trade-off. Number two, long range rifles. Different subcategories like a DMR, a dedicated marksman's rifle, would be something built for someone that's actually going to war and it's meant to be carried around a lot, so it needs to be lightweight, but you also need to be able to reach out. And then there's also like precision match rifles for three gun. Like those two guns are gonna be completely different, even though they kind of have the same purpose of being very accurate at long range. There's a, a lot of other factors that we must consider. And then number three, CQB or AR pistols, also known as short barreled rifles. We'll cover a little bit more about the differences between those here in a little bit as well. But these are designed to be lightweight, easy to carry, easy to maneuver around, but you're gonna sacrifice some long range accuracy as well as some velocities. Whenever I'm deciding to pick up a rifle or AR pistol or deciding to build one, I go to one of those three categories first. Typically, I go with general purpose or CQB. I haven't done a lot with long range, but we're gonna change that in the future. So once I have my purpose established, then I can move on to the next phase of choosing a barrel. And when I'm selecting a barrel, I have to keep a couple things in mind. There is a teeter-totter or trade-offs when you're trying to balance accuracy, weight, the handling of the rifle, the compactness of the rifle, the longevity and the durability of the internals like the bolt carrier group and the recoil characteristics of it. As we look at those six things, some are gonna be greater than the others. Like if you wanted the really good general purpose rifle, you're gonna make all of those kind of even, you know, where it kind of goes down on one side, kind of goes up on the other side. Now the choice is we make that are actually gonna affect those traits, the length of the barrel, the profile of the barrel, the material and the lining of the barrel, the rifling method and twist rate of the barrel, chamber dimensions, and the gas system. Now, if you're new to guns, maybe you've never owned an AR-15, or maybe you just kind of had like a basic rifle or something like that and you're wanting to get into something a little bit more advanced, something to keep in mind is a gun that's highly specialized is not gonna be a good general purpose rifle and a good general purpose rifle is not gonna be a good specialized weapon. And so whenever I'm recommending, you know, AR-15s or barrels and stuff for someone that's really new to this, I try to give them something that's a good general purpose do-all rifle and then they can get a taste profile built from that. Like, I don't like this, I like this. And then in the future, when they wanna make something a little bit more specialized, they can take that knowledge that they learned from that general purpose rifle and they can apply it to a new build and make the necessary changes. So let's start with the barrel length. This is kind of like your OG looking AR-15. The original AR-15 was designed with a 20 inch barrel and a rifle length gas system. And every AR-15 that has come after this has been modified in some way because this is the optimum way to kind of set it up based on the original design, on the way that the gun handles, the way to the accuracy of the gun, how the barrel heats up, and how the bolt carrier group reciprocates, how hard it reciprocates. All of those things were perfected in this design, so to speak. I'm not saying they were perfect, I'm just saying that was the original intent of this rifle was a 20 inch barrel. Now, when it comes to barrel length, on average, the longer the barrel, the more velocity the projectile is gonna have when it exits the barrel. And when the projectile has a lot more velocity, it increases the effective range of the projectile. Like, and by effective range, everyone could have a different definition of that. Like, if you're just shooting paper at like a thousand yards, the effective range is how fast does the bullet need to be going to punch a hole in paper? Versus if you're actually fighting and you're in war, or if you're a sniper, the effective range is what's the furthest out that the bullet can go and actually kill someone. Like, not saying you should, I'm saying in a wartime situation. Longer barrels are gonna have lower bore pressures inside and they're gonna be a little bit softer shooting. What that means to you is because it's softer shooting, because there's softer pressures inside, your bolt, your bolt carrier are gonna reciprocate at a slower rate. It puts a lot less wear and tear on the parts and the internals, and you get longer life out of your gun. So I would think of the 20 inch AR-15, as kind of like the Toyota Camry or the Honda Civic of the AR-15 because you're gonna just gonna get the reliability. You change the oil, you just keep driving. This one, you keep it oiled up, clean it once in a while, 
you're gonna keep running. In addition to saving the wear and tear on your internal parts, the rifle length gas system is gonna be a lot smoother gun to actually shoot at the range. Um, you're gonna get a little bit less recoil, you're gonna get a lot less muzzle rise, because number one, you're gonna have extra weight out here, and then number two, because of the rifle length gas system. Now, some people argue that longer barrels are more accurate. That is definitely true, but another thing that really helps the shooter be more accurate is longer barrels are heavier. For example, with this one, you know, a 20 inch barrel is gonna have a lot more weight out here on the front. And when you're actually standing and you're not bench rested, there's gonna be a lot less wobble and therefore you're gonna be able to actually pull the shot and hit your target a lot easier than you would with a shorter barrel because there's less weight. And I think this is something that we all instinctively already know, especially if you shoot handguns. As an example, I got a Walther PDP right here. It's a polymer pistol with a metal slide. Then I got a CZ Shatter II right here, which is completely metal and extremely heavy. Now, the interesting thing about this gun was the Shadow II was designed to have more weight on the front. And so when you're pressed out and you're actually shooting it, when you have a lighter gun, as you're emptying the magazine, the gun gets lighter and lighter. And so you get a little bit less accurate with it as you're shooting the rounds. And then this one, you can't really feel the difference as the magazine is emptying. Also, when you have more weight, less recoil is translated through the frame into your hands. Therefore, the gun itself isn't really much more accurate. It's just that most people are more accurate with it because the weight is hiding the flaws and the shakes in their hand. Also, a longer barrel decreases the amount of holdover that you need to use at a given range. If you're new to this and don't know what holdover is, say you zero this guy at 100 yards. And let's say you're reaching out to like 300, 400 yards. Well, you're gonna have to aim a little bit higher than your target in order to hit the target because if you aim directly at the target, it's not gonna make it. The bullet trajectory is just gonna go straight down into the dirt. So you have to aim high so you can actually hit the target when you reach out beyond your zero zone. When we're dealing with short barrels, as you can imagine, most of those statements are completely reversed. The shorter the barrel, the lower the velocity, resulting in a shorter effective range of the bullet, whatever that effective range means to you and your purposes for the rifle. You are gonna have increased bore pressures the shorter that the rifle gets. Uh, I'll actually throw a chart up here. Let's just pretend this is a 10 and a half inch. It's not, but let's pretend it is. Going from a 20 inch to a 10 and a half inch barrel, your bore pressures double as you cut this 20 inch barrel length in half. Kind of strange, right? Shorter barrels are also gonna be louder. You're also gonna have a greater muzzle flash on a shorter barrel um, due to some unburnt powder or powder that's burning as the bullet exits than you would on a 20 inch barrel. And because you're gonna have increased bore pressures, you're gonna have a little bit more recoil on this. And because you're having a little bit more recoil, you're gonna have a lot more velocity going through your bolt carrier group, meaning it's gonna be cycling a lot faster and it's gonna be slamming home a lot harder. And therefore your internals in your bolt carrier groups and things like that will wear out quicker than they would on a longer barrel. And it greatly increases your holdover versus a longer barrel. However, despite the original AR-15 being designed and built around the 20 inch barrel, today the most common length is a 16 inch barrel and it's gonna have a mid length or carbine length gas system. And we'll cover gas systems in more depth, but essentially all you need to know right now, the gas system, instead of being out here, is now moved to right here. And as your barrel gets shorter, your, obviously your gas system has to get moved back. But the 16 inch is probably the most perfect compromise between a 10 and a half inch barrel, a short barrel rifle, and the 20 inch rifle. It kind of gives you the best of both worlds. As an example, the 20 inch rifle is really good at reaching out and you know hitting targets at distance. However, it might be a little bit more difficult when you're trying to clear a room. I know people do it with full-size guns all the time. I'm just saying it might be a little bit more difficult. It's gonna be a lot heavier if you're carrying it around. However, with this, it's a lot lighter. It's a lot easier to carry. You can get some CQB and you can also reach out and hit targets at various distances. And despite the bullet losing a little bit of velocity, you actually only lose approximately 50 meters of range between the 16 inch and the 20 inch. The only difference is with this, you have to hold a lot more holdover in order to hit said target because you did lose a little bit of velocity and a little bit of range. Now the 14.5 inch barrel is the length of the M4 or the M4A1 carbines. Um, the M4 was adopted in 1994 after about 10 years of testing. The purpose of the M4 was 
was to bridge the gap between the 20 inch M16 and the experimental XM177, which was a 10 and a half inch short barreled rifle. And a lot of people loved the 10 and a half inch XM177. It was super lightweight, it was super compact. However, they wanted to mitigate a lot of the noise, so they brought the length back from 10.5 inch out to 14 and a half inch. And again, you probably guessed it, as we go shorter, we're gonna lose a little bit of effective range and we're gonna lose a little bit of velocity. We're also gonna increase in our bore pressures a little bit. We're also gonna increase the wear and tear on the parts and the recoil impulse, as well as the sound. On average, you're gonna get pretty much the same performance out of this as you do the 16 inch, it's just gonna be a little bit less. Now, I find that I like these a lot because they're a lot less front heavy. And I like less front heavy because I just like playing around at the range and just popping up and you know getting some shots off or coming from high ready and get some shots off. I love this length of barrel, but there are some things you need to know before you decide to buy anything under a 16 inch barrel. For some reason, the federal government decided that people didn't need barrels that were less than 16 inches. And they decided to make that an arbitrary number. So anything under a 16 inch barrel, according to the federal government, is classified as a short barreled rifle with a couple of exceptions. If you decided to buy a rifle that is less than 16 inches, there's a couple of ways around it. Number one, you can get what's called a pin and welded muzzle device on it. And this is done from the factory when you buy the rifle, or if you're gonna build it, you either need to pin and weld it yourself, or you need to take it to a gunsmith. Now this introduces a few challenges with the 14.5. Number one, once you pin and weld this guy on there, the only way to remove it is to get a welder out and remove it. So if you ever have to change your gas block that's under here or your gas tube, this is gonna to have to be removed every single time. One company did think up of a solution for this, and this is uh, the Fax and Firearms FX 5500 four pound AR-15. It is incredibly light. Carbon fiber handguard, skeletonized bolt carrier group, and a pencil barrel. Now this one is also 14 and a half inches and it's pin and welded, but you'll notice something. The outer diameter of the barrel is almost the same as the muzzle brake, and you can actually take off this gas block right over the muzzle brake, but there are drawbacks to pencil barrels which we'll cover later in the video. And the whole purpose of pinning and welding this is it brings the overall length to 16 inches, but you get a lot less weight out front, making the gun a lot lighter than your standard 16 inch. If you wanna go shorter than a 14 and a half inch pin and welded or a 13.9 pin and welded, now you're gonna to have to do what's called the NFA tax stamp. So what would be the difference with say, let's just pretend this is a short barreled rifle where my hand is. What's the difference between a short barreled rifle and an AR pistol? Two things. In order for an AR-15 to be classified as a pistol, it needs to have a buffer tube on it that doesn't allow a stock to be attached. Now this is a pistol brace and you know, right now, as of February of 2022, the ATF's trying to ban braces. Well, we don't know if that's gonna happen or not, but on average, you just have to have a tube that prevents a stock from being installed. Now you're not done. Just because you have a buffer tube that doesn't allow a stock to be put on it, that doesn't, that doesn't mean you're in the clear. If you put a vertical foregrip on here, very similar to this one. Uh, some people say that you can put this one from BCM on a short, on an AR pistol. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't want to raise any red flags, but some people claim that you can. But let's just pretend that's a legit vertical foregrip. If you put a vertical foregrip on an AR pistol, it now becomes an NFA weapon and you're gonna have to pay a $200 tax stamp and it's now illegal until that tax stamp clears. I know, really stupid. So instead, if you wanna have something to grip out here, you can get these things. This is like a hand stop. You can also get things that are called angled foregrips to put on the front. As long as it's not classified as a vertical foregrip, it's completely legal. Now, if you're interested in building pistols, there is a couple of other things that you got to keep in mind in regards to the lower receivers. As an example, let's say you own a 16 inch rifle. It is federally illegal for you to take this lower receiver slap a pistol buffer tube on here and then put a short barrel on the top. And that's because when this gun was created, its serial number was designated as a rifle. It is illegal to convert a rifle to a pistol without going through the NFA. However, if you bought an AR pistol or if you bought a completed lower that had a pistol buffer tube on it, or if you bought a stripped lower receiver, as long as you build them as a pistol first, you can convert them to a rifle later and you can convert them from a rifle back to a pistol, given that they started their life as a pistol and not a rifle. I know it's stupid, I don't understand it, but that's our crazy laws. Even though it's the same lower receiver as on the rifle, you can't convert your rifle to a pistol, but you can convert a pistol 
to a rifle and back to a pistol again. Yeah, that makes no sense. I just wanna explain that for those of you who might be new to this stuff. I was new at one point and I remember what it was like and it was very confusing. Now, as the barrels get shorter, I would say below 13.9 inches, um, you know, you're no longer able to really pin and weld them unless you pin and welded a, a suppressor to it or something like that. But I will say this, once you get below the 13 inch mark on a barrel, I find that the accuracy is super negligible between 10 and a half inch and 13 and a half inch. I find that the velocities are pretty negligible between the two. And I find that the recoil impulse is pretty negligible between the two. Now, with that being said, my first air pistol that I ever built was this guy. It's an Aero Precision, and this is a seven and a half inch uh, 556. It's chambered at 556, and it's seven and a half inches. It has a muzzle brake on it, and you'll see it has this little device around it um, that helps not shoot a lot of blasts to the side in case I'm at an indoor range. Now this thing is incredibly loud. Honestly, when I'm reached out and I'm shooting this guy, the muzzle is almost so close to my face that I could, I feel like I'm getting kicked in the sinuses when I shoot this. Now that could probably be remedied by just putting on a standard birdcage flash hider, but then you get a ton more recoil because the barrel's so short. So the muzzle device helps mitigate the recoil, but I'll just put it like this. This is just my take on a 5.56223, I think a 7.5 inch barrel is a tad too short. It's not as fun to shoot as something like a 10 and a half inch. This one is a 300 blackout and a lot of you guys know 300 blackout is a lot heavier of a bullet and they have a lot lower pressures. They tend to be softer gun to shoot. So this one has an eight inch barrel. I don't feel like I'm getting kicked in the sinuses when I'm actually shooting it. So aside from the barrel length, another thing that we have to consider is called the barrel profile, AKA the thickness of the barrel. Now the barrel profile is balancing like three different things. Um, number one, heat management. Number two, the handling characteristics. And number three, the accuracy. You know, obviously a really thin pencil barrel is gonna be a lot easier to handle and carry around. However, it's gonna heat up a lot faster than a thicker barrel like this guy because there's less metal to resist the heat change. Something we're we're gonna learn as we go throughout this video is as barrels heat up, they tend to get less accurate. In addition to the thickness, the way that the metal is actually distributed along the length, you see notice how this one is thick up here near where the receiver is and then gets thinner as we go out. All of those things are gonna balance out those characteristics and it's gonna affect how the barrel performs at different tasks. So let's talk about heat management, for example. With a bull barrel, a bull barrel is typically the same diameter from the receiver all the way to the tip. Now the bull barrels are some of the best at resisting heat change. Because they resist heat change, they're able to be one MOA or sub MOA accurate after the barrel's gotten hot. Now the downside to them is they're incredibly heavy and you don't wanna be lugging them around or carrying them with a sling if you can help it. Another type of thick barrel aside from the bull barrel is gonna be the H-bar barrel. They're similar to the bull barrel, but they kind of do this step down effect of getting thinner as they go down towards the tip of the barrel, whereas this one you can see slopes. And those are also really good at maintaining their accuracy after they get hot. And they're also really good at resisting heat change, but again, they're heavy, similar to the bull barrel. And just a couple of seconds ago, I mentioned how how when barrels get hot, they become less accurate. And you'll hear this referred to with the term of the barrel opens up after it's hot. Typically between a thick barrel and a thin barrel, like the pencil barrel, the first couple of shots, the accuracy will be really close. There'll be some differences between a pencil barrel because there's barrel whip. On average, if you have a one MOA gun, the first five rounds or so out of both guns are gonna hit about one MOA. Now, the changes occur after they heat up, and after they get hot, you'll start seeing the thinner profiled barrels start shooting maybe 1.5 MOA or 2 MOA, and they just can't sustain the heat very long. You gotta let them cool off, and then you can shoot them again. Now, there is another barrel called the government profile barrel. I actually don't own a government profile barrel, but the goal of this barrel, if you notice how it's kind of thin, a little bit closer to the receiver, and then there's a sudden step, and it's thicker out on the end. The goal of that, earlier we were talking about six 16 inch, 20 inch barrels, how the 20 inch barrels had more weight on the end and prevented the wobble zone. That was the goal with the government profile barrel when they cut them down to 16 inches. They wanted the shooters to be able to maintain a tighter wobble zone, so to speak. So instead of the gun moving around like this, now the gun moves around like this and therefore they can be a little bit more accurate. In the civilian world, none of us really use them. I mean, I'm sure there are people out there, but I really don't see them very often. And instead there's this guy. 
Now this is a 308 barrel I'm just using as example purposes, but just notice the profile how it has this nice soft slope. And this profile here is kind of your best middle ground in regards to heat dissipation, handling characteristics, and being accurate. And a lot of companies have different terminology for this exact same profile. As an example, Facts and Firearms calls theirs the Gunner profile. Criterion calls theirs the hybrid profile, and Ballistic Advantage calls theirs the Hansen profile. And there's other companies that have different names, but they're all referring to the same thing. Now, choosing the best profile for you goes back to what is your original purpose for the gun. Let's just pretend, for example, you like to shoot long range, and you like to shoot long range either prone or sitting down using a bipod. Well, you're not carrying that rifle around, so you might as well get something that's pretty darn heavy, like, like an H-bar barrel, or a bull barrel because that barrel is gonna be able to resist the most heat, it's gonna be able to maintain its rigidity as it gets hot and it will be a lot more accurate as you're shooting it. Maybe you want something that's built real tough but can also reach out and shoot really long distances very accurately. You'd build something like a DMR, dedicated marksman rifle. Those are meant to be carried around a long time and they're also meant to be accurate out at distance. So for a DMR build, you'd want something that's a little bit lighter. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the video, a lot of these rules that we're talking about today are just in general. There's always exceptions. However, when it comes to the exceptions with barrel profile and weight and everything like that, this is where barrels can tend to start to get a little expensive. As an example, this is a Tactical Solutions uh, bull barrel that I have on a 1022 that I built a couple of years ago now. It's a bull barrel, but this is the lightest 1022 barrel that I actually have. Part of it has to do with the materials used, which we'll cover that in a bit, but it has to do with these really heavy flutes. And what's cool about fluting on a barrel is it allows the barrel to retain its structural integrity in regards to resisting heat change, in regards to the structural integrity of the barrel whip and everything, but it makes it a lot lighter. So I have a barrel that's called flame fluting that came from Facts and Firearms on a 300 blackout. Um, you'll also notice on LWRC rifles that they do a spiral fluting on a lot of their barrels. And, and what that does is it allows you to run a barrel that resists heat change and is less likely to open up after it gets hot, but it's not heavy. And this is where things start getting expensive. Proof Research is a fantastic example. They probably make the epitome of the accurate lightweight barrels with their carbon fiber barrel. Um, with theirs, it's mostly stainless steel towards the receiver group. And then there is a carbon fiber sleeve. And underneath that carbon fiber sleeve is a very thin piece of metal. That's where the bore of the barrel is. I mean, it's thick enough that it will not rip or anything and it will last quite a while, but those barrels can be six or $700. So there's exceptions to rules, but all exceptions come with a price. And this brings us into the barrel materials and the composition of the barrels, you know, AKA what kind of metals are used and types of coatings and things like that. On average with AR-15s, you're gonna come across two basic types of metals. Now there's different metals within them, which we'll cover. Number one is gonna be stainless steel. Number two is going to be chromoly. With chromoly barrels, you're gonna see kind of two different types. You're gonna see 4140 and you're gonna see 4150. The 40 and the 4140 and the 50 and the 4150 are an indicator of how much carbon is present in the steel. 4140 is 40% carbon, the 4150 is 50% carbon. And these are what's known as ordnance steels. So what does that really mean to us as gun enthusiasts? Well, higher the carbon content means it's gonna be a harder alloy metal and it's gonna stand up to extreme temperatures much better than 4140, such as shooting it in full auto and getting the barrel really hot, or if you're shooting it in really cold temperatures, higher the carbon content, the better it's gonna perform in those extreme conditions. Um, the third type that you're typically gonna see is chromoly vanadium or vandium. I don't know how you say it. You might see this abbreviated as CRMOV. Um, that just stands for chromoly vanadium or vandium. The vanadium process actually promotes a finer grain structure within the metal. It also increases the wear resistance and the strength of the barrel. With 4140 and 4150, there's different levels of certifications. So for example, with the military specifications of 4150, it has to go through a new a process of being classified that way. And I'm not gonna read it out, but here's the code on the screen. That is the specification for the military. So all mil spec chromoly barrels are 4150, but not all 4150 are mil spec. And that's because it costs extra money to have your barrel certified by the military. And not a lot of companies actually wanna spend the money to do that. In my experience, whenever you're looking at a website and you're looking at the product description of a specific barrel or anything like that, if it's not stated, then it's probably not. Don't assume that it is. And if you really wanna get, go, 
Sorry, my kids are screaming and I'm trying to record. But if you really wanna verify, always email the company or call them on the phone and double check it yourself. But the reason you'd want something that is mil-spec certified is it's gonna have tighter tolerances. Whereas a 4150 barrel that's not mil-spec could have some looser tolerances and might not be as accurate or as reliable as that you had hoped. I would say stay away from 4140. That's just my advice. They're not gonna blow up on you or anything like that, I don't think. But I just don't mess with them because 4150 isn't that much more expensive and getting 4150 that's mil spec isn't that much more expensive than that. This brings us to stainless steel barrels. Now I only own two stainless steel barrels. One of them is this one that I've been using as our prop piece and then the other one is in my AR10 308. And it's funny because the only two that I own at the moment are 308 barrels, but I will be getting some AR15s in the very near future that are stainless steel barrels and we're gonna do some more tests as this year progresses. There are three types of stainless steel that you might see. There's gonna be 410 stainless steel, 416 stainless steel, and 416R stainless steel. If you see a barrel that is 416 without the R designation, don't buy it. It's not the same thing as 416R. 410 is the most hard steel that is available for stainless steel barrels, but it's also a little bit brittle. In addition to that, there are two things that will change the characteristics of the way that these barrels shoot and perform. Number one, the temperature at which the manufacturer actually tempers their steel barrels at. And number two, do the stainless steel barrels have a molly vandium coating added to them after the fact? On average, 416R does, 410 doesn't. What's the difference? If you live in a really cold state like Minnesota, where it gets below freezing, you wanna get 416R. The chromoly vanadium helps it perform better in those temperatures. Not only that, but if you're shooting a 410 barrel, in really freezing conditions, below freezing, there is a possibility of something called stingers. So I couldn't find any information on the internet on what a stinger actually is. The only thing I could find was don't shoot 410 stainless steel in freezing or you'll get stingers. So I asked my buddy Mike from Mr. Guns and Gear and he said they're basically hairline fractures that can occur in the barrel. Now, this is not a common thing, but if you live in a cold state, you want 416R stainless steel. 416R stainless steel barrels can perform into temperatures as low as negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If you live in any other state with just a standard climate, you might wanna get a 410. It's a little bit harder of a material and it performs well in normal conditions, as long as it's not under freezing. The reason 410 is uh, more durable is it has a lower sulfur content in the stainless steel. But because it has such a low sulfur content, it becomes brittle in freezing temperatures and that's where the 416R barrel really shines. Now, although 416R stainless steel barrels do perform better in freezing climates, it's best to avoid thinner profile barrels if you're gonna be shooting in those kinds of conditions due to temper embrittlement. So if you have a thicker barrel like an H-bar or something that is like a bull barrel, they're gonna be less likely to get temper embrittlement. Now we get into the protective linings that are put onto guns, like I was talking about earlier with like vanadium or vanadium, whatever you wanna call it. This is where the differences between stainless steel and chromoly really become apparent. A chromoly barrel and a stainless steel barrel, they're gonna be machined bare before any coatings are added. And at that stage of the process, technically speaking, they have the same level of accuracy. However, you're never really gonna find a bare chromoly barrel out in the wild on the market because they need a protective coating to resist corrosion, whereas stainless steel doesn't quite need it. And there are different methods in which some manufacturers choose to coat their barrels to resist corrosion, and there are some methods that other companies use. And this is another highly debated topic on what's better. The first type of coating we're gonna discuss is chrome lining. And the way that simply works is once the barrel has been bored out of the center and they've done the rifling, we'll cover more on rifling in a minute, they are gonna go on the inside of the barrel and they're gonna remove a layer of material from the inside of the bore. Then they're gonna go through with a machine and they're gonna do a chrome lighting on the inside of the bore and it's, it's gonna bring it back to specifications for the bullet to actually travel through the barrel. Now, historically speaking, chrome lining negatively affects accuracy. That's because in the early days of chrome lining, they didn't have a way to actually get a consistent, even surface on the chrome lining. However, with today's technology and the way that things have advanced, chrome lining doesn't really suffer from that when you buy it from a reputable company that actually takes a lot of care and does a really good quality control inspection on their barrels. You won't see uneven surfaces typically in those barrels. Now, if you get something that's cheap, those differences in thicknesses are gonna become more apparent. This goes back to what I said earlier, buy once, cry once, or buy nice, or buy twice. A couple of companies that are doing a really good job with the chrome lining in their barrels are gonna be FN America, that makes chrome lined barrels, as well as Criterion. They've figured out a way to really streamline the process of chrome lining 
where you get very little, if any, uneven surfaces in the chrome lining. The only chrome lined barrel that I currently own is this Bravo Company Recce 14. It has a chrome lined heart, cold hammer forged barrel. We're gonna talk about cold hammer forging in a second. And their barrels are actually from FN America. In addition to that, BCM does a, what's called like a 100% quality control. Like as an example, let's just say they ran off 100 barrels to be manufactured. They're gonna go through the process of inspecting all 100 barrels. And if any barrels fail their inspection, they get thrown in the trash basically. But they still had to pay for that barrel to be manufactured. So the cost of what they lose from the stuff that failed QC, that gets tacked on to the parts that we buy. This is why quality parts cost more money. Now, there might be another company, I'm not gonna say any names or anything. I don't know everyone's QC methods, but one company might say, we're only gonna inspect one in 10 barrels. So for every 10 barrels produced, we're gonna inspect one. And if that one passes, we're gonna pass the whole batch of 10. I hope that makes sense. But just know the more QC means they can't produce the parts as fast because they're throwing away a lot of parts and it means that the parts are gonna cost more, but you're more likely to not have a negative experience with said product. But with Criterion, for example, like you can get a chrome line barrel that's gonna shoot sub MOA almost. So those old myths of chrome line barrels being inaccurate are still true if the process is done incorrectly but if it's done correctly, you can still shoot one MOA or a little bit less. Now, the next process that companies use is a process called melaniting or nitriting or salt bath nitride or tenifer or QPQ. There's a lot of different names that this goes by, but it's all the same thing. If you don't have a barrel with you and don't have any own any nitriding barrels, the best way I like to think of nitrated barrels is that of the slide on the Glock 19s, especially on the newer ones, or like the Smith & Wesson MMPs. These are all nitrided coatings. Um, nitriding is the surface conversion process whereby the manufacturer takes a barrel, say pretend this is a chromoly barrel, and they're going to dip it into a salt bath. It's typically a nitrogen sodium solution. And they're going to heat it up to anywhere from 750 to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that temperature range is going to become important here in a little bit, but just keep that in mind, 750 to 1200 degrees. After the nitriding process, the barrel is going to have a lot more lubricity to it. It's going to be encased in a hard outer shell and it's going to have a Rockwell hardness from anywhere from 60 to 65. However, if they didn't do this coating, the Rockwell hardness would be anywhere from 28 to 32. So the doing the nitriding process essentially doubles the hardness of the steel. In addition to that, it makes it more corrosion resistant and it reduces the friction coefficient of the bullet as it travels through by adding lubricity. It even has a lower friction coefficient than stainless steel and that of chrome lining. Now, one of the coolest things about a melanited barrel or nitrided barrel is the way that it wears over time. So earlier we were talking about stainless steel barrels. Out of the box, a stainless steel barrel is gonna be more accurate on average than a melanited barrel. The downside to stainless steel, on average, there's always exceptions. Every stainless steel barrel, depending on the manufacturer, is gonna have a different lifespan, especially when people are trying to shoot like really tight groups, one MOA or less. What happens with this is they're gonna have a different lifespan. So let's just pretend that this barrel had a 5,000 round sub MOA lifespan. It'll shoot sub MOA every single shot with some exceptions like barrel heating up and stuff like that. But if we shoot the barrel kind of cold, it'll always hit sub MOA. But look, once it gets to that 5,000 round count, it's gonna start to open up. Your sub MOA groups or your one MOA groups are gonna become two MOA or three MOA. And with stainless steel, when it opens up, it opens up drastically and it opens up very quickly. Whereas with a melanited barrel, it's going to open up gradually over time. So for example, a melanited barrel will never have that sudden jump from one MOA to like three MOA. It's just going to gradually open up over time. And a lot of it's going to be dependent on how you shoot the gun. You know, if you're shooting a lot of rapid fire through it, shooting full auto through it, it's going to wear out a lot quicker because you're heating up the barrel and letting it cool back down, heating it up, letting it cool down. There's not really a way for many barrel manufacturers to really give you a guaranteed round count on them because they have no control over how you use it in the types of heat cycles that you put the materials through. However, there are cons to the nitriding process, and this is where choosing a reputable company to buy from really comes into fruition. Downside number one, whenever you have a barrel nitrided, 
the company will then do something called stress relieving. So what is stress relieving a rifle barrel? If you fired a barrel immediately after it was rifled, its accuracy would quickly degrade very fast as the barrel heats up. And in order to prevent this from happening, we have to do something called stress relieving. To stress relieve a barrel, they heat it up to about a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, and that relieves a lot of the stress in the barrel. It also softens the steel a little bit as a byproduct. So if it's done incorrectly, as we were talking about with the nitrate process is 750 to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's just say they did the salt bath nitride at 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, and they also did the stress relieving at 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. They could undo all the nitriding that they just did, and if they don't have a good QC program, they're gonna ship you a shoddy barrel that isn't gonna perform worth a crap. This is why I talk about buy nice or buy twice. When manufacturers are manufacturing these barrels, especially if they're doing something with a melanite coating and then doing the stress relieving, they have to be very careful on the temperatures that they use. Typically, if you're gonna do the stress relieving, it probably needs to be nitrided at 1200 degrees, so therefore the 1000 degree stress relief won't undo it. I'm just speculating, I am not an engineer, so you can let me know if I'm wrong down in the comments. The other downside to a melanited barrel is that it's a lot less heat resistant than the chrome lining. And so if you're gonna do a lot of full auto shooting or rapid fire shooting, the chrome lining is actually gonna resist the heat better than the melaniting. And if that's the kind of shooter you're gonna be where you're shooting a lot of rapid fire, maybe some full auto fire, if you have just a standard melanited barrel that's not chrome lined, then your lining could fail and then you're not gonna be accurate at all. Rifling. Now there's three types of rifling. There's cut rifling, which you're mainly gonna see on like bolt action guns or really high-end Gucci guns that most people aren't gonna buy. So we're not gonna talk about cut rifling, but you're gonna see button rifled and cold hammer forged. Button rifling is essentially, company gets some bar stock that they're gonna use to cut their barrel out of. They get the barrel done and everything, they drill a hole in the middle, and then they're gonna pull this plug that comes through the barrel, and the plug has cutters on it, and it's gonna twist at a certain rate. Um, we'll talk about twist rates in a minute, and it's gonna cut the grooves out of the barrel, and that's how the rifling is formed. With cold hammer forging, on the other hand, it's a lot different. Cold hammer forged, let's pretend this is gonna be cold hammer forged. When they get the bar stock, and they have the barrel, it won't be as long as they originally intended it to be. It'll be about this long and it'll be real thick. They're gonna put this into a machine. In the machine, there's gonna be a rod that goes through here. And that rod is gonna have like the outline of the type of rifling that they want. You're gonna have like four hammers that are gonna hit this barrel from all sides. And as it hits, it's gonna elongate the barrel but not only that, it's compressing the metal against the rod that forms the rifling until the process is complete and the desired length and everything is met. Now, cold hammer forging has a ton of benefits. Um, number one, it creates a very tight grain compression on the metals. And number two, it creates a stronger metal. Now, there are some downsides. The downside is it puts a lot more stress on the metal itself than that of its button rifled counterpart. And with that said, there are only a handful of companies that actually cold hammer forge barrels specifically for the AR-15. And that's because the machine to do cold hammer forging costs $6 million. FN America has one, I think Daniel Defense has one, and there are some others, I just can't think of them off the top of my head. But I do believe the amount of companies that actually manufacture them I could probably count them on one hand. There are companies out there that produce rifles and they get their barrels from FN America. So as an example with this BCM, you can get a cold hammer forged barrel. It's also chrome lined and it comes from FN America. A lot of people don't know this, but on Palmetto State Armory's website, they actually have complete uppers or barreled uppers that have FN cold hammer forged barrels on them. I'll be sure to include some links to those guys so you can find them very easily over at the parts list that we mentioned earlier, just in case you wanna check them out. But the pros of a cold hammer forged barrel, you're gonna get on average a way longer barrel life. That's the main pro of cold hammer forging. However, the, the cons are they cost a lot more money. I mean, if you think about it, if I'm company A and I wanna do a cold hammer forged barrel and I'm selling these barrels, it's just, let's just say I'm selling them at $500 and I just spent six million dollars on a machine I gotta sell a lot of barrels to even break even on a six million dollar machine and this is why we don't see it very often now a lot of higher-end brands that fully assemble guns actually do include them I believe Geisley Super Duty Rifles have cold hammer forged barrels Daniel Defense has cold hammer forged barrels BCM 
so on and so forth, but not all of them. The other downside, which is heavily debated, is that cold hammer forged barrels are less accurate, meaning you don't get the sub MOA accuracy. Now, I've seen people on YouTube who have taken a button rifled barrel and a cold hammer forged barrel and trying to keep everything else equal, they were able to shoot one MOA groups with both. But then I've also seen YouTube videos where people did the same thing, but then they didn't get one MOA groups with the cold hammer forge barrels. So I say all that to say this, there's a lot more that goes into accuracy than just the barrel. The main thing to take away from this is rifling is very important, but I think one of the reasons why people give it so much weight is because of marketing geniuses making you worry about certain things. Yes, cold hammer forging is gonna be way more durable and last a lifetime, uh, just depending on how often you shoot versus a button rifle barrel. But let's just be really honest. How many rounds a month do you really shoot? Can you outshoot a 40,000 round barrel? Now I'm not saying it's 40,000 round sub MOA barrel, but can you outshoot a 40,000 round barrel? Those are all questions you're gonna have to answer for yourself. Since we're talking about rifling, there are different shapes to the rifling. You have your traditional, what's called land and groove rifling. Then you have something called polygonal rifling. This is another one of those areas where I think people kind of overemphasize something that isn't as important as people make it out to be. Your traditional cut rifling is gonna be landing grooves and they're gonna be harder edges within the rifling pattern. Whereas polygonal rifling is gonna have more of a smooth rifling pattern, but essentially they all do the same thing. They make spin going out the end of the barrel. I will say this, polygonal rifling is easier to clean. Because of those hard angles in traditional rifling, sometimes the copper and or lead can get kind of fouled up in those grooves and it can be a little bit more cumbersome to get it cleaned out. Whereas polygonal rifling, because it's gonna have more of a soft shoulder, it's a lot easier to clean. I will give it that. But in regards to accuracy, I haven't noticed much of a difference, but maybe some precision shooters out there that are watching this video could comment that down in the comments and let me know if I'm wrong or right about that. Now let's talk about high pressure testing and magnetic particle inspecting. Now, some people say that this is a outdated method of testing barrels. I don't seem to think so, but some people do. Now, when you see these insignias, you're only gonna see them on bolts for the bolt carrier group and barrels. If you see high pressure tested, then they're gonna be magnetic particle inspected. Some people argue that high pressure testing is not necessary and only magnetic particle inspecting is. So with high pressure testing, they're gonna take a round and put it into the barrel and fire it. And this round is gonna contain pressures far beyond any type of ammo that we're ever gonna shoot. And then once it's shot, they're gonna see if there's any visible cracks or deformities on the barrel. After that, they're gonna go through with a machine and magnetic particle inspect it. And what that's gonna do is gonna shoot particles at the barrel. It's gonna test for microscopic cracks that we can't see with the naked eye. And once it passes those two things, they'll stamp HPT or MPI or both of them on the part. So then when the customer receives it, they know that it was inspected correctly. For me, I try my best to always get something that's high pressure tested and magnetic particle inspected. However, I have a lot of barrels and bolt carrier groups that aren't high pressure tested and they've done just fine for me. Only thing it really tells you is when they sent it off, it didn't have any imperfections. So if you received the barrel and you shot some rounds through it and got some imperfections or some cracks or anything, it happened when you got it, not when it left the manufacturer. So it's just peace of mind, so to speak, at least for me. You can make your decision on whether or not you think that's important or not. To me, I think it's fairly important to at least be magnetic particle inspected. So let's talk about twist rate. You're usually going to see twist rate denoted as a fraction. Typically it's going to be 17 twist rate, 18 twist rate, 19 twist rate. I've seen some that are 110 and 112 and 114, I've seen that as well. What does that mean? In this case, the numerator, which is the one in the fraction, describes one rotation, and the denominator in the fraction is gonna to refer to how many inches it takes to perform that rotation. So for one and seven twist, that means for every seven inches of barrel length, you're gonna get an entire rotation. Now, a lot of people, including myself in the olden days, probably seen charts floating around the internet where it's like, if you're gonna shoot this weight of a bullet, then you need this twist rate. Although that's kind of true, it's not true. Let me explain. So the original AR-15s had a one and 14 twist rate. However, the military likes to use tracer rounds. Tracer rounds have a longer projectile than a standard round. And because of its elongation of the round, it's gonna weigh more. Obviously, it's gonna be longer, it's gonna have more mass, it's gonna weigh more than 55 grains. However, the military realized we need a one in seven twist rate so that we can better stabilize the tracer rounds. So therefore, they chose a faster twist rate. So one thing to keep in mind, more length means more mass, 
means faster twist rate. On average, for most of us out here that are just plinkers or enthusiasts, or maybe we like to go train a little bit, if you get a 1.7, 1.8, or a 1.9 twist rate, you're not gonna see it much of a difference in them, especially if you're doing like a general purpose rifle. It might make a difference once you start reaching out and doing some precision shooting, you might see a difference. But very similar to rifling, a lot of people put a lot more emphasis on twist rate than they probably need to. It's important, yes but it's not as important as people make it out to be. I have barrels that are 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9, and at practical accuracy when shooting for self-defense, when you're shooting at a torso, it's not gonna make such a difference in accuracy that you're not gonna hit the threat. Now, if you're trying to hit paper and you're trying to just split hairs, yeah, it might make a difference. On average, most people are gonna shoot a 55 grain projectile, usually a 223 or 556. They're typically the cheapest that people can buy. And so if you're gonna go with something that's that light, it's probably gonna be a little bit shorter. And therefore you might wanna get something like a one and nine twist. I can't tell you uh, what twist rate to get. If you're conflicted on one seven, one eight or one nine, just cut it down the middle and get a one eight. That's up to you and it depends on the purposes of your rifle. This brings me to gas systems, and gas systems is one of those things where when you first think about it and look at it, you're like, that's probably not that important. I think choosing the right gas system is actually a lot more important than choosing what your twist rate's gonna be. If you didn't know by now, the AR-15 is a gas-powered system, and there's multiple types of gas systems. There's direct impingement, which is what we're covering today, and, and then there's also piston-driven. They essentially kind of operate the same. They, they kind of operate off the same principle, just with a different mechanism. With direct impingement, as the bullet travels down the barrel, there is gas behind that barrel that is pushing it out. As you get to the gas port, the gases are going to take the path of least resistance and they go up the gas block and travel all the way back to your bolt carrier group down the gas tube and that's what cycles the gun. We were talking about dwell time earlier. There's a certain amount of space from the gas port to the end of the barrel. And what that time does is it ensures that the gas is able to make it all the way back to the bolt to complete a cycle before the pressure is completely relieved when it exits the barrel. So if the bullet exits prematurely, then the gas won't be able to make it all the way back to get a full cycle. Hope that makes sense. Earlier in the video, I talked about the original AR-15 was designed with a 20 inch barrel and a rifle length gas system. This is the longest gas system that you can get for an AR-15. And as we talked about, it's also one of the more softer shooting. It's one of the more reliable. It's also gonna have lower bore pressures and it's also gonna be a lot easier on your internals preventing premature wear and tear. Now, as our barrels get shorter, because our dwell time is gonna change, they have to do some other things to make sure that our guns cycle. On average, as you're, you go down to a mid-length or a carbine length or a pistol length gas system, sometimes there's not enough barrel in front of the gas port to ensure enough dwell time. So sometimes they have to drill out the gas port hole a little bit larger when you're getting shorter. Now, not all companies do this. So some companies might make, say, a carbine length and they drill the hole too small even though there might be enough dwell time, it might not function properly or vice versa. They could drill the hole too big and now you have an overgassed gun and then you're either gonna need to get a heavier spring or buffer for your lower receiver or you're gonna have to put an adjustable gas block on here to kind of choke up the gas so you don't get over gas situations. This is something I recently learned and uh, we'll talk more about this in future videos. But there are some higher end guns out there. I'm not gonna say any names because I have one of their guns coming in and we'll talk about it when I actually review that gun that purposefully over gas their guns. Now, a lot of people speculate the reasonings why these higher end companies are over gassing their guns, but it basically comes down to this, ammo selection. So most people that buy AR-15s and they're just gonna go to the range and just have fun, they're not really trying to be crazy accurate are going to shoot uh, sometimes bottom bucket ammo and in order to get some crappy ammo to cycle you're going to need to over gas it a little bit whereas if you took crappy ammo and put it into a properly gassed gun then it's not going to cycle properly so a lot of companies that are really popular will over the gas their guns on purpose because they don't know what kind of ammo that their customer is gonna shoot. The downside to this is these companies, although they sell $2,000 rifles, they don't include a way to choke up on the gas. So if you want to be able to choke it up, they don't include an adjustable gas block, which I think if I'm gonna spend $2,000 on a rifle, they can actually shell out an additional 50 to $100 to include an adjustable gas block. Maybe you want something that is shorter and you want a short barrel so that when you suppress it, it's not crazy long. And, or maybe you want the suppressor to actually sit underneath the handguard a little bit. This isn't a suppressor, but this is a muzzle device and you can see how it sits flush. 
Maybe you want to do something like that. And so you go out and you buy a gun and it's overgassed. Whenever you add a suppressor to a, an AR-15, it's going to increase the gas pressure. So if you're already overgassed, it's just going to make it even more overgassed. And so this is why adjustable gas blocks and having the right buffer springs, I'll have links to different gas blocks that I like over at the build list and some springs and stuff. But when you're going to suppress a gun, you want adjustability so you can really tune it for shooting whatever ammo you're going to shoot. That's kind of a problem when higher end companies are selling overgassed guns. So how do you know if your gun is actually overgassed, undergassed, or properly gassed? Look at your ejection pattern of your shell casings. So when you're holding your rifle out like this, if your shell casings are kicking out at the three o'clock position, all the way back to about the 430 position, that's considered perfect ejection. But however, if you see your shell casing going forwards, anywhere from 12 o'clock, two to three o'clock position, anywhere in that range, then it's overgassed. You're gonna need to get a heavier buffer, heavier spring, and or an adjustable gas block so you can choke down on it. With that said, if you start seeing shell casings kicking back from the 430 position all the way to straight back at 6 p.m., then it's most likely gonna be short stroking, meaning it's undergassed. And a short stroke is essentially that the bolt doesn't go far enough back to actually catch the next round and load it. Now, I've had this happen with a few different guns that I've built from scratch. One of the best ways to remedy this is to get a lighter buffer, lighter buffer spring, because you can't add gas with an adjustable gas block. But the way I like to do things is I kind of like to get an overgassed gun and then put an adjustable gas block on it and then I can crank, I can lower it and lower it and lower it until I close the gas port completely off if I wanted to. So it's always easier to remove gas than it is to add gas. It's just two different methods. I think an adjustable gas block is needed for most higher end rifles. And that's just kind of where my head's at. The next thing we're gonna talk about is chambering. Now with AR-15s that are chambered in 5.56 or 2.23, you're most likely gonna see one of three different kinds of chambers. 5.56 NATO, 2.23 Remington, and 223 Wild. I know a lot of my, the more advanced viewers that are watching today's video already know this, but if you're new to this, if you get a 223 Remington, you can only shoot 223 out of the barrel. However, if you get a 556 NATO, you can shoot 223 and 556 out of it. And if you get the 223 Wild, you can also shoot 556 and 223 out of it. They're essentially the same thing, but the throat of the chamber is going to be a little bit different spec on the 223 versus the 556. And so therefore with the 223 Remingtons, their chambers aren't as supported as well as a 223 Wild or a 556 NATO. A lot of people that try to get sub MO accuracy typically go with 223. And then people that are wanting to get something that packs a little bit more punch, you know, maybe for varmint hunting or, you know, for self-defense and things like that, typically get 556 five, NATO. The differences are very minuscule. We're not going to go into too much detail about that, but I wanted to bring it up just in case you're new to this. The main thing to take away from this, if you have a 223 Remington chambered barrel, don't ever put a 556 in it because it could explode. Now, I know that I just barraged you with a ton of information and you're probably wondering like, hey man, what the heck do I do with all this info? And we'll get to that in a second. But one thing that I think is just as important, if not more important than the way the barrels are manufactured and the way the rifling's cut and all that stuff has to do with the way that the companies manufacture and design these from the start, as well as doing their quality control and making sure that they do all the right temperatures when they're actually trying to manufacture these barrels. Because you could have all the right specs on paper, but if it's performed incorrectly, then it really doesn't matter. And so that's why it's important to go back to what I was talking about earlier, buy nice or buy twice. I would never recommend that everybody buy the most expensive barrel in the world, but I would say buy the best barrel that you can comfortably afford. That's going to serve the purposes that you need it to perform. So now you're probably wondering, all right, man, I really appreciate you making this video and giving us all this information. What do I do with it? Or what kind of sense can I make with this? Number one, 99.9% .9 of people who buy an AR-15 shoot less than hundred rounds per month. I know this because I know people that do statistics and ask around and do studies. With that said, let's just pretend you did shoot exactly 100 rounds a month, it'll take you 10 years to shoot 12,000 rounds. Let's pretend this barrel only had like a 5,000 round count before the sub MOA accuracy went away. That might take you four years to burn out this barrel. 
before you need to replace it with another barrel. So you don't always need to go buy the most expensive thing in order to buy once, cry once. All I'm saying is you need to buy the right thing for your purposes. Now, for those of you guys that are just gonna buy pre-made rifles or pre-made AR pistols and things like that, most of this stuff you're not gonna have to worry about. The main thing that I would look at is what kind of shooting are you going to do? You know, and after we've gone through all these things, you can really see how choosing the wrong barrel for your purposes could totally ruin your AR-15. If you got a pencil barrel and you want to shoot sustained full auto, you're going to have a bad time. That barrel is going to be gone really quick. On the other side of the coin, if you chose the H-bar or the bull barrel and you're actually going to be carrying that barrel around on a sling, you're going to be hurting. The barrel is definitely the most important part of the AR-15 that you're going to need to select. And therefore, it's one of the parts where I allow myself to splurge even if I'm doing a budget build. The second most important part is going to be the bolt carrier group. And I will put a link to a video I did two years ago on how to choose bolt carrier groups. If there's any questions I didn't answer in today's video, let me know down in the comments. But until next time, guys, I love you. You guys stay sexy.